It's a very good question. You know, I, I, I scratch my head because the consensus on China has become so overwhelming mm. that if you say anything even close to being constructive, you're sort of viewed with, with a kind of suspicion. That's how bad it's gotten. So I don't know. Trying to de deconstruct exactly how we got here is hard. Obviously, when Trump became president, and let me just say, Trump to me is, going back to what I was saying about Hofstetter, Trump is both symptom and cause. So if Trump didn't exist, the underlying politics are still there. He happened to have capitalized on them rather well. Uh, but the Trump story I know fairly well because I was, in the early days, I was quite involved with it. Um, and you remember in the beginning of the Trump period, the, the fear then was that trade was going to be a real problem. Mm -hmm. And I was asked by the White House to um, help Lighthizer on the U.S.-China trade stuff. Mm -hmm. Because his counterpart was a, was a person called Vice Premier Liu He, who I knew very well. And so I saw, met with Lighthizer, and I said to him, Bob, oh, by the way, I didn't know him at all. And he had a reputation for being a real hawk. So I said, Bob, there's only one model of U.S.-China relationships that I know works. And I will call it the Kissinger, Joe, and Lai model. And th that's this. The respective presidents appoint somebody who's very senior, who's very trusted, and the two presidents say to the two people, metaphorically, get in a room and don't come out until you've got a solution. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what Kissinger and Joe and Lai did. And so I said to Bob, Bob, that's the only model that works. You absolutely have to follow that model. And what you have to do, you can't delegate this. You have to build a relationship of trust with Liu He. I've known Liu He for 20 years. He's a good guy. He did his master's at the Kennedy School. He speaks good English. He's an elegant, elegant man um, and a very bright man. And I'm telling you, whatever the result would otherwise be, it's going to be better if you do it the way I've just described. And Lighthizer, to his credit, did exactly that. And the irony is, Four years later, the trade channel was still wide open. Mm -hmm. So during the COVID period, for example, uh, when the White House was telling American manufacturers of medical supplies, you know, we need all your stuff fast. And a lot of these American medical companies were manufacturing it in China. And because the Chinese COVID thing happened earlier, the Chinese government had done the same thing. They would said to Johnson & Johnson, no, no, you can't export staying here in China. So the American companies are having to tell the White House, well, we're happy to comply, but a lot of our stuff's in China, we can't get it out. And so they came to Lighthizer and to me to say, can you talk to the Chinese and get them to let the stuff out? So we went through the trade channel, and I said that we had a conference call with um, five CEOs of American medical companies. I said to them, you're going to think this is crazy, but I'm telling you this is the way to get it done. I need to know the name of the specific plant and the plant manager and his WeChat number. <laughs> you give me that and I'll get it unlocked. And that's exactly what happened. But the reason I tell you the story is because notwithstanding all of the harumphing and all of the storm and drung, that channel was actually very effective. Mm -hmm. But what then happened was Trump not having the discipline to kind of follow through on his, his, original, his original engagement with Xi Jinping, which by the way was very positive. Uh, and Trump kind of you know, he, he sort of uh, engendered and, and <laughs> was not at all bothered by a kind of a world of chaos. So he suddenly started hearing these speeches from Pompeo, Navarro, Pence, you know, this person, that person. One was more hawkish than the next. And so this started going, getting worse and worse and worse. And then I think the domestic politics, the way that played out was, I think the Democrats decided that the the very voters who Trump managed to pull away from Hillary Clinton, who simplistically were essentially uh, middle class or working class, Midwestern, mostly white, mostly male voters, that those voters Biden was able to bring back, and those voters were on the very negative end of the China uh, issue, and therefore, we, the Democrats, cannot afford to let the Republicans get to the right of us on China. 
Therefore, both the Republicans and the Democrats are kind of fighting it out. Mm-hmm. Who's more hawkish on China? Right. And then once that starts going, then it engenders all kinds of behavior, which I'm sure you've all experienced. You've seen, you know, at the, at the very negative end, you've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of despicable behavior on the part of the government towards Chinese Americans, Chinese nationals, particularly in academic institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, on the one hand, at the other end of the spectrum, you've seen people inspired to write and research, and some of the stuff's quite good, mm-hmm. whether it's hawkish or not hawkish. Right. Okay. 